uh, feisty and committed, and uh, and they're they are what is going to stop torture in the future here. And people like John. I mean, it's kind of uh, funny for me. I mean, there are risks in academia to uh, fighting torture. It's a little bit, uh, it's not, you know, fighting the American Psychological Association is not quite like fighting the CIA within the inside side. And uh, we we have um, for a long time really in, admired John. Uh, I mean, John, his bold moves in, in, in prison, I mean, writing to the outside world, um, he, is, he is a courageous man, and um, I told him that it was, uh, consider buying this book, I mean, it's, uh, it's incredible. Um, so one, one more, one more. <laughs> uh, yeah. so we want questions for, for you, so you're all going to have to, someone's going to have to stop me after, after 15 minutes, but... All of you have taken uh, at least introduction to psychology courses, probably. So you know some of the fundamental, the Milgram obedience experiments, and the um, what what clinical psychology is, Zimbardo, that we have uh, ethical codes that clinicians are not supposed to sleep with their clients because we sort of have uh, this this power. Um, I you know I don't know if psychologists uh, have a real power with our tools of psychology. Um, we do have other forms of power in, the, in terms of respect, and I think part of what gives us that power is our ethics, that, that we do believe that we have a moral code and that we will not violate it. And so what I'm gonna actually talk about is, is a little bit less about torture, although it is about torture, but it's more about the corruption of, of civil society. And so to have a profession uh, like medicine, psychiatry, psychology, uh, being involved in torture, uh, that's, you know, that adds a, another scary element to it. When the people who are supposed to be healing mental health are actually reverse engineering those techniques, as the techniques John talked about, the enhanced interrogation techniques, to torture using psychological pain, creating post-traumatic stress disorder and, uh, and making it so these individuals cannot even uh, be tried. Um, so John already gave a great introduction to that, but basically in 2005, after Abu Ghraib, uh, Guantanamo, CIA black sites, all this information was coming out, uh, the CIA and the Department of Defense needed psychologists. They needed psychologists uh, because they thought they could get more information. They, they thought psychologists would be able to help with interrogations. I actually think um, someone with uh, John's charm can, can get information out of people better than a psychologist could. Uh, but the psychologists were really used to legitimize torture. So uh, the definition of psychological torture, the invisible form of torture, was basically if you create post-traumatic stress disorder, that is torture. And we all know that there are many, many sort of psychological and painful techniques that can lead up to that, that can lead up to trauma, and that no psychologist is able to say, okay, if you stop there, uh, PTSD will not occur. But given this redefinition of psychological torture, psychologists needed to be in these places, I mean, according to intelligence. One, one, one CIA document we found was that a psychologist was present in every instance of CIA waterboarding, basically to say, stop, because if you keep going, it's gonna lead to a permanent disorder. So, I mean, it is like, this is the dark side, and this is the dark side of, of our field of, of psychology and other fields as well. So basically the American Medical Association, American Psychiatric Association said there is no role for, for physicians or psychiatrists to be part of these national security interrogations. American Psychological Association came out with a task force that was made up of mostly Department of Defense people. People we later found out were, were in the chain of command in places where torture was occurring. And this uh, task force basically said psychologists will play an important role in the national security process through interrogations. So uh, 
behavioral science consultant teams, psychologists would, would guide interrogations, locate vulnerabilities, they design detention um, punishment paradigms, removal of toilet paper. Eventually, originally this was psychiatrists and psychologists guiding these much of these interrogations. And um, eventually the Department of Defense said, we're, we're going to use psychologists over psychiatrists. So this is not a sort of story about me, but it's a story of, I don't know, there's, there's five of us psychologists who were really brought together to, to work on this issue, and then there are maybe another 40 who have also really put pressure. Psychology, the American Psychological Association is the largest body of psychologists in the world. And uh, what we suspected from the beginning, but we didn't even know it was this bad, that this Penn's task force that made this decision, they were made, they, um, these decisions were made by the CIA and by the Department of Defense before that, that uh, essentially the, the, the lessons or the, the guidelines in those report, the, that report was created by intelligence in the military um, before this task force even started. Fortunately, one of my close colleagues Jean Maria Rigo was a whistleblower on that task force, gave us information. We were brought in, Physicians for Human Rights, everyone who's speaking up about this issue, they brought us together. And since then, we formed the Coalition for Ethical Psychology. And we sort of became investigative psychologists. We, um, I mean, for the last 10 years, 20 emails a day at least go back and forth, us figuring out what's going on. We did not have that outside information, but using our psychological skills and Google, um, it's amazing what we could find and what we could uncover. And so we changed American Psychological Association policies by putting pressure on them through open letters, through com committees, all sorts of events. Uh, many people resigned from the American Psychological Association, thousands and thousands. Uh, it's a group of 100,000 uh, psychologists. And eventually, we put together a referendum because the internal council of APA wasn't going to do anything. So we got the membership to vote on an issue, and we won that referendum that basically said psychologists cannot be at any national security site that violates either the, the U.S. Constitution or international law. But of course, the American Psychological Association still fought. Guantanamo is not a violation of, of uh, U.S. Constitution or international law. As John pointed out, uh, it is. And so um, it's just, it's been a long, long fight. The APA has promised accountability. They had names of psychologists who were engaged in torture. They had the names of uh, James Mitchell, who was an APA member um, in 2006 and is now being sued by the ACLU, an architect of the torture program. Um, they, the, the, the APA has not done, their ethics office had not done anything to, um, to look into these cases. I mean, we had very, very clear, clear evidence. But eventually, um, a, a couple key pieces came out, and I think this is where I played a little bit bigger role. One was uh, uh, Kevin Kiley, the Surgeon General of the Army, was, giving, uh, was having a debate with Physicians for Human Rights at, um, in Chicago, and I went up to Kiley afterwards, I'm like, what do you think about these biscuits? And he said, oh yeah, I talked to this uh, Donovan the other day, they're great. And it turned out that Donovan, Deborah Donovan, was married to the head of the APA practice directorate. She was a Guantanamo biscuit, we later figured out. And this head of the APA practice directorate, I'm sorry, there's a lot of names here, but he basically influenced this Pence task force from the beginning. So what a conflict of interest. He never mentions that his wife, uh, he, he controls this task force and never mentioned that his wife was a biscuit. Um, What's a, biscuit? What's a, biscuit? a biscuit, the behavioral science consultant. That's the psychologist who guides the interrogations. So, yeah, no, please jump in for clarifications. I'm, I'm trying to go quick to, to, uh, to meet John's time here. Because um, since I asked him to uh, uh, give me a little bit, he didn't need to give me that much. 
but uh, the, the, the happy news is, uh, so we found out that, we found out Rand Corporation had this really suspicious study that they were doing at Guantanamo. So I called someone I knew in the, the substance abuse research world and asked at Rand and said, what's going on? What is Rand studying here with Guantanamo? He's like, I don't know, that's really creepy. I don't, I don't go down that hallway, but I know a guy. And so I called this guy, Scott Gerware, and he was this really enthusiastic young man, really into to psychology, and, and, um, but he, he wanted to use it, you know, psychology for interrogations. And uh, he had also worked with, with APA on a couple CIA workshops. But he basically, um, we lost him after a while. Uh, physician, a guy from Physicians for Human Rights hooked up with Scott, and then Scott got murdered. I, no, I'm sorry, not murdered. That, that, what, a, what a Freudian slip. <laughs> he was hit by a dump truck on, on his mo motorcycle. Um, so forget the murder part. Um, but, uh, but anyways, uh, his widow gave the, his email um, correspondence with the American Psychological Association to Physicians for Human Rights. We passed it on to Jim Risen of the New York Times. Jim Risen, in his book, came out with a chapter on the APA issue and, uh, and, and wrote about it in the New York Times. APA came after Jim Risen, and that made Jim Risen mad, which was not a good thing. So that battle began, and then the APA said, we have to do something. So they hired an independent attorney, David Hoffman, Chicago, Sidley Austin, who wrote a 500-some page report that um, essentially, at the end of it, and this was the good news, um, said that the critics' understanding of, of the Pence Task Force was correct. APA officials colluded with DOD officials, loosened the APA ethics code, and already added to the porous legal constraints that already existed. And uh, had it gone differently, um, psychologists would have had a more difficult time harming detainees. And um, so he had a message to the field of psychology that, uh, that we do as psychologists have a special skill that can heal or damage. And uh, when the profession allows for the infliction of pain on those with an inability to resist, the faith in the profession can diminish. And so we as a field need to define for itself what is ethical and legitimate. And, uh, and I'll stop there. So we have a short-term short success here, um, but changing that big institution of the APA is a little tougher. <laughs>